Hi, Victoria. How are you? Thanks for being here with us in Taekwondo Passion. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here with you guys. The honor is us. Uh, well, to start the, the, the question that I do to everyone, for all the people that doesn't know you, who is Victoria Stambo in your words? Uh, in my words, I would say uh, someone who, um, number one, puts God first in everything, or at least tried to. Um, my faith is everything to me um, in Christ Jesus, and uh, my passion is Taekwondo and uh, and glorifying and serving God through this outlet of Taekwondo. Um, someone who um, is athletic, but has been through a lot of obstacles, but has persevered and has a mentality not to give up and is stubborn in that way. <laughs> and uh, that's what makes me who I am. Great. Uh, I, it comes to me a uh, quick question. You're, you're always been a person of, with a, of, of faith or that, that, that's been a more recent thing in your life? Um, I, I grew up as a Christian in my household. Um, it was when I was in first grade, I kind of made that decision. I can remember vividly. Um, so growing up, that was my faith, uh, my choice. And uh, I think when I got in my later teen years, uh, early 20s, I kind of uh, went away from what my kind of faith was and what I knew uh, how I should be representing Christ in my life. So um, there was definitely times where I kind of uh, faded away, but it's just been the that foundation and the absolute truth of it that has always brought me back um, to seeking it even more so than ever before with passion and uh, which has led me to the the Christian woman that I am today. Perfect, thank you. Uh, before before starting to talk about your career, I want to know, I know that your father and your grandfather were, were involved in, in boxing, right? Yes. And do, did you practice as a little girl some some steps and some yeah. jab and all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, when I was little, um, I actually started boxing, learning boxing before Taekwondo. So, um, like you said, my great gra my grandfather was a boxer. Uh, my dad was a professional boxer, and um, uh, he, he taught me boxing before anything, really. So I was throwing my punches before kicking or anything like that. And um, his, uh, him as a boxer and me learning boxing before Taekwondo has helped me in Taekwondo with footwork and a lot of my head movements and, and obviously my punching in Taekwondo. Um, so I've always had that foundation of boxing, which helped me uh, a lot in Taekwondo. Um, my, my dad didn't want me to pursue boxing, even though that's his passion, just because um, he and my mom did not want me doing any uh, contact like that to the face. So we were able to compromise with Taekwondo. <laughs> Excellent. And how was that, the, that decision made of you starting Taekwondo? how they pick up the school and what do you remember of your first classes and all, yeah. all those days? Yeah, at first I did karate and I remember it. I remember just being so shy and scared um, <laughs> of just being with a lot of people, but I enjoyed it and I realized I was, I was pretty good. And then that was at seven years old. And then at eight years old, I went to Taekwondo because my cousin was doing Taekwondo um, at this center that um, my dad actually knew the owner. So, um, so we decided to go that route and do Taekwondo because my dad uh, was told that we do actual contact sparring there. And my dad really liked that. And so he wanted me to <laughs> kind of do it because of that. And yeah, so. That was, that was in Texas, that first the, Taekwondo yeah. school? It was in Pasadena, Texas, where I was born. And that, that, in that school, you started from, uh, from your childhood to start competing? Yes. So I started at eight years old there. And um, I started 
from there, I got my black belt there. I got my first Don there. Um, so um, I was there pretty much more or less till about 13 years old. Um, yeah, so 8 to 13. Wow. And what qualities do you would you highlight of that first instructor, if, if we can know his name, and how he helped you in that first road? Well, there was a lot of instructors at the school. So um, uh, there was the master instructor, and then there was the uh, just the instructors and the assistant inst assistant instructors. So there was a lot of instructors at the school. So I can I I would say give credit to all of them. Um, because it was more of a, a sparring school. I think it was very kind of uh, is physical and it was a little kind of hardcore in the sparring side. So their focus was a lot on Olympic sparring, uh, not so much on Poom Saves at that time and, um, and demo and stuff like that. Their focus was sparring. Like that's, that, that's what made their school um, – uh, who they were. It was uh, the Olympic sparring. Excellent. And how was your, how did you start it in competition? What did you remember of your first competitions? Uh -huh. um, I think I was, I think I want to say I was 10 years old um, when my, when one of the instructors found me at that school. Um, he, uh, he invited me to the sparring team there. And um, so I, I just, I was like, no, I kind of don't want to, but then I did, uh, cause my, he spoke to my parents and then my parents were like, okay, yeah, let's go ahead, give it a shot. So I went and I did pretty good. So I guess I just kept going. Honestly, I just did whatever my parents told me to. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was pretty good at all sports. I did all sports and any sport that they put me in, I was pretty good. And, um, I always kind of excelled. So. Um, my first tournament, I won, I remember. Um, and I think I remember I hurt the girl to where <laughs> she was crying a lot. And I think they had to put her like in a stretcher or something because she was crying so much. But I remember winning and I got gold. Uh, I think I was like a blue belt and, uh, and the girl was crying really badly. <laughs> <laughs> what other sports did you play? Uh, growing up, I soccer. I played a lot of soccer growing up, um, and then also I did a little bit of basketball in junior and high school, and um, uh, track as well. Um, so, I, and I enjoyed all sports. I was able to play volleyball. I could play football. I can um, really play anything that was put in front of me. <laughs> Perfect. And why did you decide to specialize in in taekwondo too? Well, um, it was, I was 15 years old and I was on this division one, uh, soccer team. Um, I was playing for them at the same time I was training Taekwondo and, um, at 15 years old, I made the U S national team. Um, I was the youngest one there to do so. And it came to me that this is what I want to do. Like, I, I only want to do Taekwondo. I only want to pursue uh, Taekwondo in the Olympics because before I really didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, whether it was soccer or Taekwondo, because I was very good at both. I, I, they were right there. But then soccer, I don't know, just the team, it wasn't so fun for me. So um, it just wasn't that appealing. And then uh, making U.S. national team, uh, at so young, I was like, okay, I think I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm only going to focus on Taekwondo. You, you reach uh, USA national team, I suppose, by winning a, a national competition. Do you remember that competition? And what do you, what were your feelings when you received your first dog with the USA letters and all, yeah. all that stuff? Yeah. So, uh, I made the US. USA junior national team when I was 14 and uh that was amazing uh I really didn't know or understand the 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 coolness of it yet but then uh, as I went on and went to junior world championships with them and I saw the amazing things that we did there I was like wow this is really cool um and then when I made the U.S. national team uh for the seniors 
at 15 years old. Uh, I remember vividly winning uh, because it was really big uh, for me, being the youngest one there uh, with not much experience coming in kind of as people not really expecting me to win. Uh, I had to face the, one of the ex-Olympians from USA um, and uh, another uh, good girl who was very tall and she was actually in a higher weight category that came down to flyweight. Um, so I just remember everyone going crazy and everyone super happy. And I jumped, uh, you know, with my coach and just hugged him and we were just so happy. And it was, it was amazing. It was such a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Just, a, a milestone in my life where, uh, it was a, a change of kind of everything uh, as far as my focus. Um, and so that's when I started to focus uh, a lot on Taekwondo. I guess in, the, in those times you started to, to dream of Olympic Games? Yes, I think it was then I started to uh, finally say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to train to go to the Olympics now. Um, before I was like, okay, you know, let's see, whatever. I, I honestly didn't know. Again, I was good at uh, many sports and uh, soccer. Everyone thought I was going to go on and get a scholarship and go play for a university and et cetera. And so um, the fact that I made U.S. national team, I decided, decided yes, it's only going to be Taekwondo and now I want to go to the Olympics. So um, that was the time, the milestone, I would say, where um, the Olympics was in my, was my goal. In that time, did you switch to train to another place? Yeah, I was. Um, so at first, my trainer who found me was Jesus Armadores. And then he sent me to go train with Paris Armani. Um, and Paris really kind of changed my whole game, my thinking, uh, my technique. He fixed me up to get me from this level to up here, world-class level. Um, so, yeah, my trainer, um, it was both of them, but uh, it was Paris Armani who really kind of changed my technique, my thinking, uh, really uh, helped me get to that next level that I needed to be at. Great. What do you remember of your first uh, international competition, like a uh, world championship? You, you were in youth world yeah. championships, right? Yeah, so uh, my first junior world championships was in Izmir, Turkey. Oh my gosh, I was 14 years old and I just remember being like so nervous. I, I didn't know what to do. Honestly, I froze when I was fighting. I, I fought Azerbaijan and she went on to uh, win bronze and I lost by a point. But I could have beat her. It's just I was so scared. I didn't know. Uh, I was nervous of fighting. I, it was my first international tournament. Uh, and I'm on this junior uh, world stage. And I'm in a country that I've never been to, uh, Turkey. It was amazing, amazing, amazing experience being in that country, uh, being on the junior national team. And, um, and then... The, for the world championships in Denmark, that's when I uh, was on the U.S. national team, 2009. Uh, that was an, another amazing experience. It was a big eye-opener. It was a huge, you know, world stage. Uh, I saw all these countries uh, competing. And uh, that, that competition, that world championships was unfortunate because I felt I was so, so prepared. And then one week before, I ended up tearing my hamstring uh, badly to where I was, I was not able to walk. I was limping. I, was, I, was, I couldn't kick. Um, and honestly, my, my, the doctor on the team, um, he knew I, w I shouldn't fight. He told me, you, you should not fight, but I'm not going to stop you because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So... Just, just do it, you know. So I fought. I lost in overtime, but uh, it was it was very difficult uh, walking out of there. My my leg was all bruised, and I almost needed surgery. 
uh, but thankfully I didn't. Um, so that was my first big injury. I was 16 years old at the time um, at, at the World Championship. So that was unfortunate. But um, yeah, and that's kind of the start. <laughs> okay, and you, you don't regret fighting that, that World Championships? No, I don't regret fighting it. It kind of showed me that even though I didn't have the strength in, the, in my right leg, no, it was my left leg I tore, the left leg I, I pulled, And uh, even though I didn't have the strength or anything, I, I totally blocked all the pain out. Uh, and my ability wasn't really there, but I didn't think about it. And at 16 years old, that's pretty strong. When you just don't think about your injury, you don't, you don't feel sorry for yourself. I never made an excuse. If you saw me fighting, you would have never known that I had the injury that I did. And that was the point that stood out to me the most. Uh, the fact that I went, went in there uh, pretty much, in my mind, acting like everything was perfect, um, when deep down inside it wasn't. And, um, and afterwards it showed. <laughs> That's amazing. And yeah, I, I, I want to know if it was some kind of motivation that you, you did a, a good fight going to overweight, injured. Did you thought something like, well, if I can do this injured, what can I do when I'm 100% fine? Yeah, uh, that's 100% true. Honestly, I was kind of, I was even mad that I lost, even with my injury. <laughs> I was like, man, I did one, like, oh, I, you know, how did I lose, whatever. But, uh, but in my mind, I said, you know, even if I did win, it was a blessing in disguise because I could not continue. The injury was so bad. There was literally no muscles holding together. It was completely torn. Um, so if I would have continued to fight uh, the next fight, I don't know, I would have been so much worse probably to the point where I did need surgery uh, or would have need surgery. So I'm just glad that I didn't win <laughs> and, I, okay. and, I, and it stopped when it did. Amazing. After that, that world championship, was that you switched to compete for Puerto Rico or was later? It was later. Um, so in 2010, in 2009, 2010, yeah, in 2010, uh, the beginning of 2010, I actually tore my ACL the first time. Um, when I was 16, it was January 2010, I was fighting at the U.S. team trials to try and make junior national team again. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I, at that team trials, I tore my ACL. And so I was out that whole year until 2010 of December. December 2010, I came back for a tournament in Monterrey uh, for the Pan Am Open. And uh, I fought there under USA. And I got gold. And the president of the Puerto Rican national team, he was there, Luis Arroyo, actually. <laughs> oh. um, yes. <laughs> okay, <Yeah>. good name. <laughs> and uh, and uh, someone told him that I have, uh, my family's Puerto Rican. And so uh, he said, well, you know what, invite her to our team trials, blah, blah, blah. And if she wants to make the Puerto Rican team, we still haven't uh, named our Olympic team yet. And Uh, she still has a chance and whatever, whatever. So when he, when I heard that he said that, I said, okay, yeah, let me go try out for Puerto Rico because at that time the U.S. had, had already um, established what weights they were going to take and it was going to be 125 and welter weight. So it was going to be feather and welter and those weren't my weights. So I said, okay, well, then my goal is the Olympics You know, I want to get to London, that, London at the time. And so since I knew uh, the USA was not going to take my weight for London, I said, okay, then let's go try Puerto Rico and see if I can make it uh, for London. So in 2017, I'm sorry, 2011, when I was 17 years old, uh, I went to fight for Puerto Rico. Excellent. Do you, you were born in the USA, right? I was born in Pasadena, Texas, USA, yes, sir. But your parents both are Puerto Rican? 
No, my dad is Puerto Rican. My mom is from the border of uh, Texas and Mexico. Okay, great. And I, I, from what I, I have read, you are proud Puerto Rican. How do you feel of representing that country? I'm very honored. I love, uh, of course, I love, um, you know, my family's country. It's, it's my country as well. I, it's my home as well. I don't feel a foreigner to it. I feel like that is my home. The island is um, where I've trained, where I've lived, where I've had a lot of tears, where I've had a lot of victories, where um, I've gone through so much over there, where I spend my time with my family over there, with my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. Um, a time where it's beautiful memories for me there at the same time hard as well you know good and bad but um i consider it uh, an honor and i'm very proud to be able to represent puerto rico as if i was born and raised there but um but just having my family there and being with them living with them and um just getting to know my family's culture through that it's been a true uh, blessing, really. It's really been a blessing. Great. And how how has been that that road to the Olympics, to this Tokyo, from that that switch that you made of country? Yeah. So in 2011, I made the switch the switch to Puerto Rico, and then um, you know I was trying to go for London. That didn't happen. Um, I was really upset and down because of that. Uh, because I really thought like I was going to go to London. That was in my mind, London, London. And then, um, so that didn't happen. And then in 2012, that year um, of the London uh, Olympic Games, I tore my ACL meniscus at the Pan Am Championships in Bolivia. And uh, that was a game changer for me. That changed my whole career. Um, and... Um, So it was, I think it was October, October, November. It was like October, November, the Pan Am Championships in uh, Bolivia. And so I came back home to Houston and I went to see a, a doctor, Dr. Lowe. Um, he's a doctor for the Houston Texans uh, football team and uh, all the professional sports teams here in Houston. Um, I went to go see him for my knee uh, that I recently you know, injured and Pan Am Championships, and um, he checked it out, and sure enough, he said, yeah, you have a pretty bad meniscus tear that we're going to have to repair, and you also have an ACL tear that we're going to have to repair in the left knee. Before he walked out of the room, um, I kind of got his attention. I said, one second, can you actually check my right knee as well? Because for the past two years, I've been fighting, and it, I always fall, and that it feels like it's loose. Um, so can you check the right one as well? He checked it, and he, as he was checking it, I will never forget his face. And he looks to his assistant, and he looks back at me, and he says, your right knee is worse than the knee that you just tore. Um, you have nothing in there. And uh, he started asking me about the last ACL surgery I had. And he was appalled. He couldn't believe it. Um, and then he said, we're going to have to do surgery on both of your knees. So um, in 2012, I had an ACL meniscus in my, my left knee. Uh, and then in 2013, I had a removal of my ACL in my right knee. Uh, which was really nothing there. It was like a long string that was kind of like flapping. It was not tight. It was loose and it was flapping everywhere. It never took to my body. So in January 2013, they removed that and they did some other things to kind of, there's a lot of stuff in my knee that they just <laughs> kind of screwed up in my last surgery in 2010. And so he kind of had to refix it. And then again in 2000. 13 March or April, April 2013, he went ahead and put the ACL back inside uh, a new, new and a good ACL back inside my right knee. And so that started the process of my recovery. 
for both of my knees, uh, ACL meniscus of the left. And uh, I came back in 2014 and uh, everyone was pretty curious to see how that would go. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you feel after that surgery? Training um, and... <laughs> yeah, I felt amazing. Honestly, it was like uh, a miracle from God. I mean, he set me up with this amazing doctor and um, I never thought back in 2010 when I had 2010, 2011, even 2012, when I had the surgery of my first ACL that I tore when I was 16, that doctor, he really, he did a horrible job, basically, long story short. Um, he should have been sued, honestly, but uh, that's a different story. And uh, uh, he, uh, yeah, the ACL never took to my body. So coming back from uh, my surgeries of 2013, um, I was surprised. I was like, wow, I feel normal again. I didn't know, like, I can actually feel this way. I thought I was going to feel like I did previously, um, but in both knees. But in fact, it was the total opposite. Uh, after both of the surgeries, I felt normal. I felt strong. I felt complete. Like, uh, my body was back together again. And uh, you can feel it. You can feel when something is missing in your body. So um, I finally felt complete. And so coming back, uh, I think I was very strong. Um, you know, physically, I was there physically. It just took a little bit for me to kind of come back mentally because I knew there was a lot of people against me. I knew there was a lot of people, uh, you know, saying, like, what is she doing here? You know, she just had all these knee surgeries. She needs to sit down and go do something else with her life. And uh, I did very well, actually, in a couple of the tournaments in the beginning. However, it was kind of hard for me to go uh, with a long day of competing because I just wasn't used to it. So the first two fights, I would do really good. And then after that, I would just kind of mentally and physically be exhausted. So it took me a while to get to where I needed to be for my third, fourth fight. Well, what kind of, of work did you do extra for recovery, like in a mental way and in a physical way for that rehab? Um, a lot of, a lot of strength training, a lot, a lot of strength training. Um, and I loved it. I, I recovered from my ACL surgery in 2013 within five months. And that was insane. That was kind of unheard of. My doctor, when he saw how quick my recovery was, he was, he was, he had no doubt that I would be fine coming back. Uh, he knew that I was just a different kind of person mentally, uh, than the usual person that has an ACL surgery. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I came back strong because of my, uh, uh, recovery from the, the physical training. Mental training, honestly, at that time, I didn't do too much because I didn't know a lot about it. Um, I wish I did know more about it then, but, but that was back in 2013, and um, I still wasn't, uh, I didn't know too much about it yet. Excellent. And after, how, how was that uh, coming back to competitions? I, I imagine, I suspect that you have after another surgery, right? Yes, I had two more. Um, so I came back 2014 and I, that year I got silver at the Central American Games, uh, which kind of changed everything up for me and how people started to see me as uh, an actual potential uh, comeback fighter. Um, so... So yeah, in 2015, I went to Pan Am Games. 2016, I went to the Olympic qualifiers, missed out there. That was really devastating for me. Then um, I honestly thought I was going to be done. I didn't know if I want to continue. I felt compelled by the Holy Spirit that I did need to keep going and that uh, I wasn't done there. That was only the beginning. That was literally only the beginning for me. And my... At first, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm done. And then I just had a, this compelling 
um, just fulfillment that this was not in, it was actually the beginning. Um, and so that was the beginning of my career. That was the real beginning of my career towards the Olympics. Um, and so in 2017, it was a good year. Um, but in 2018, I did have a meniscus surgery where it was a meniscectomy of the meniscus where they had to actually pull out about 15% of my meniscus. So, you know, it was a small surgery, but they did take out tissue of my meniscus. And in the long run, it did kind of hurt me uh, because the following year, 2019, um, I started going to these tournaments, world championships. Um, my knee, I knew there was something wrong with it. I just didn't know quite what it was, but I did in my mind think it was the meniscus. Um, but I eventually I just kept going. I didn't even, I just kept going. Didn't even think about it. Until the Pan Am Games came along and uh, in Lima, Peru, 2019. And I fought. And my first fight against Argentina in the second round, uh, I remember popping. I can remember hearing a pop in my meniscus. I went down and I knew exactly what I did. I said, that was the meniscus. Get back up because if you stay down, you're, it's going to get to you mentally. So... I got straight up, and just like I did in 2009 at the World Championships, I acted like I, there was no pain. I totally blocked out the fact that I had a big injury, and I didn't think about it at all. Um, so I was able to get past that fight and win it. Uh, it, was, it was hard just because my knee, I, it did have pain. But then afterwards, I just remember limping back, trying not to show it, but it was painful. It was so painful. And going into my next flight, fight with uh, Colombia, um, honestly, I didn't want to fight. I was just, I was pretty much ready to just, I, I, I can't, I was not able to physically say like, I don't want to fight because that's just not the person I am. I'm always going to just go uh, and go and go until I'm dead. <laughs> but I said to myself, I know I need to be smart. I'm just going to do enough to get by the fight and then, uh, and then call it a day. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I did. And uh, afterwards, I went home to see my doctor, and he said, yes, you, in fact, do need another meniscus surgery. He thought that he was going to take out another maybe 15% on my meniscus. Um, so it was going to leave me with about 70% uh, of my meniscus left. So I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, let's do what we got to do and let's get back to it. Um, so ends up, I go into surgery. And it was August 2019. And um, while the surgery was happening, like literally I was asleep and everything. He comes to my parents in the waiting room and tells my parents, I'm sorry, but the meniscus doesn't look good, and I, it's going to be your call, but we're going to have to take out more, than, more of the meniscus than I thought, and we're pretty much going to have to take out everything, leaving, out, leaving probably 20-30% of her meniscus. Um, my parents pretty much said, whatever you feel is the best for her. Um, so he, he spoke with my parents for a while on this. Um, while I was in surgery. And uh, so he made the decision, along with my parents, to go ahead and take out my meniscus, um, leaving me with about 20 to 30% of it. And so, um, so I woke up from surgery thinking, you know, everything went to plan and everything went smoothly. But uh, my, my parents told me the news, what had to happen. And when they told me that I had like 20, 30% of my meniscus left, I, I went insane. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, my, my abilities, my health literally um, was taken from me. I, in my mind, I was thinking I was just taken my abilities. I was just taken away 
my passion, my athletics, everything that I know what to do, how am I going to be able to do this now with no meniscus? Um, so it was a very hard time. My doctor came to me and told, told me, you know, why he had to do what he did and explained it to me um, and the severity uh, of my meniscus. And, and he had he couldn't know that until he was actually under the scope um, in, in surgery. So that's why uh, things had to change. He said, actually, that the meniscus just came. He, he wasn't trying to. But the meniscus just came right out. It was just so bad. It was it was just nothing really. So um, so yeah. Anyways, uh, after that surgery, I I uh, I didn't know how it was going to continue. I thought I was going to have to quit. I really didn't think I was going to be able to go to Olympic qualifiers um, and perform and even qualify. Uh, in my mind, I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to even be athletic and even take a walk or go on a run. You know, it's kind of insane not having that tissue in your knee that you need. So in my mind, I didn't know. I thought I was done. Uh, it was really the only reason why I continued is because I just surrendered it to Christ. And I just said, God, if this is, if this is going to happen, it's, it's going to be because of you. I, I, Mentally, physically, I'm exhausted. Spiritually, I'm exhausted. And I can't go on anymore unless you just open the doors for me and get this done for me. So for me, it was really just letting go, letting go, letting go of any control, letting go of any um, just control. I just literally released everything to God and said, if this is going to happen, it's going to be because you get it done. I'm going to put forward my best work and, and step in the ring. But honestly, at the end of the day, it was, it was God's will for it to get done. And, um, and now I'm here after the Olympic qualifiers, um, you know, this past March, 2020, um, it was truly the work of, of God, truly the work of God. After the surgery and where when you were thinking all of this and you you go back from, from the surgery to the first to your first training, did you feel that your body were, were was actually like that, that that all your abilities were gone? Um the first training, no, I was like, okay, I think I can do this. I think I can be you know, active and athletic. I think I can do this. But I was still able to feel the the missing of something in my knee. Like you can feel that there is something missing in the knee um, or in your body in general. When everything is connected in your body, right? Everything is connected. So when something's missing, your body, your brain, it can feel that. It can sense that. And so I was able to sense it. Um, and so mentally for me, it was like, scary it was very scary to be able to sense that and uh but going to training I remember I was very scared I was like what's gonna happen I was able to feel my knee kind of you know do this motion to where like they clap um at first and then I was just like oh you know this is weird for me I don't know uh what I'm gonna do or what's gonna happen but I was like okay, but at least I can be somewhat active and I can move and do, and it doesn't hurt. So there wasn't pain. It didn't hurt. Um, so I was like, okay, I might be able to do this. So it was just time little by little and talking to my therapist and talking to a, finally a mental coach who I found here in Houston, who she's amazing and helped me a lot. So Um, just talking to my mental coach, talking with my therapist uh, and my trainers. I mean, it really helped me. And honestly, for me, I did less training. I stopped training so much. I was, I'm telling you when I say I, I released all control, even to 
you know, when we train a lot, it's like we we gain the control because now it's like up to us because we're training so hard. So we take the control and say, if I win or lose, it's going to be because my training. Right. And I took it differently. I said, you know what, I'm going to train how I know I need to smart. I train three times a week, Taekwondo, two times a week, conditioning and physical, like lifting, weightlifting and things like that. And then the rest was mental training, everyday mental training, everyday mental training, every day watching fights, every day looking at my opponents, every day looking at different fighters, coming up with ideas, every day visualizing. Um, and uh, that was the difference. That was the difference for me. And just surrendering the outcome. It, you have to surrender the outcome to, uh, to anything you do, you know, release that. Uh, control, surrender the outcome, win or lose, because it's the soldiers who go into battle with the mentality of win or uh, die or are not that perform their best. And so I went into my battle with whether I win or lose, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to perform my best. Amazing. And what do you remember of, of that day of the qualifiers, the Olympic qualifiers? I was beautiful. It was the most beautiful day I can ever remember. Honestly, it was, it was like a dream. I, um, I remember being so peaceful. It was, uh, I wasn't nervous at all. Uh, I usually get like headaches because all the nerves from tournaments. I didn't have any headache. I was just so at peace. Um, I remember just laying down and closing my eyes throughout the whole time in the holding area. I'll, you know, kick out and then just close my eyes and just lay back, very relaxed. Um, I do remember, however, I was in, I, I had a, a small injury, a ligament sprain in my toe that I was like, wow, dang, it hurts. It hurts. So, and then after the first fight, I remember the girl, she like really bruised my leg up and gave me like uh, some Charlie horses in my leg. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this day, but don't think about it. Don't think about it. So my goal was to stay in the moment every single moment of the day. I didn't think about my next fight. I didn't think about the finals. I didn't think about winning. I didn't think about losing. All I thought about is what I was feeling in that moment And just knowing that moment was soon going to be done and over and the next moment was going to come. So I just try to stay focused in the present and not think about anything else that was going on. Even my injuries. I felt bad. Honestly, the first fight I fought, I was like, oh, I'm a little tired. I don't feel uh, necessarily like myself like my 100% physical self I, I didn't feel like it was all there so I said to myself I'm gonna fight differently I'm gonna be smarter I'm gonna do what I need to do to win I'm not gonna try and do anything fancy I'm just gonna wait for the opportunities and be smart and just relax and if they get a point on me stay relaxed if it's whatever happens stay in the moment because it's gonna change the next moment So uh, that day was a day that I lived moment by moment and uh, at peace, even though I'm telling you physically, I, I didn't feel like my 100%. Uh, I, was, I got a little tired at times too. So I, I couldn't think about that. I was like, don't think about what you feel. Just think about what, what, what's in front of you right now. And right now, all I'm going to think about is just what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. And I just kind of visualized on everything that I was going to execute, everything I was going to execute. Um, so it's just a lot of that. And then after, after I won, um, it was just an overwhelming sense of, of it happened. Like this happened. Like this is, like this is real. Like it, it, I just remember just thanking God, thanking God, and just being just filled with overwhelming 
presence of peace and joy and love and just feeling that and feeling like I was in heaven. It was amazing. It was very an amazing, amazing experience. That I, I guess that moment by moment thinking was a thing trained for you with, with your mental coach? Yes, absolutely. Um, it was a uh, it was something that I learned um, leading up about surrendering the outcome. So for me, I learned about living in the moment, um, not thinking about the top of the mountain, but what's right in front of you, and then what's right in front of you then. And so staying present in the moment, uh, not thinking about my next opponent at all. First, I have to fight the fighter that's in front of me, not thinking about the third round, not thinking about the second round, but thinking about the first round. Okay, first round's done. Now, thinking about the second round. Okay, now second round's done. Now third round. Um, and now that fight's over. Now I'm going to go to sleep and I'm going to visualize. I'm not going to think about what's next. Okay, now it's time to prepare. Okay, now I'm going to think about uh, what I'm going to do in this fight. Okay, and then just round by round, moment by moment. Uh, that's how I was able to stay calm, stay at peace and... Uh, Yeah, just surrender the outcome again. It was, I was very happy. I remember going into my fights uh, smiling. You know, I was just, I was excited and I was happy. And a happy fighter, I always say a happy fighter is a, is a scary fighter. Because, um, you know, when you have someone who's like 10, especially in Taekwondo, it's not a sport where you have to kill the person. It's a sport where you have to win. So uh, you don't want your emotions to take over you. So you want to be able to control your emotions, right? So when you have emotions of anger um, or aggression, uh, sometimes that can get to you when you're losing. So when if you're losing and you're angry in the beginning, you're going to get more angry because you're losing. So the emotions can really get to you if you have that mindset. But if you go in there happy and at peace, Uh, surrendering the outcome, not, you know, just going and performing and, and being happy, then uh, then if you're down, you know, you're like, oh, I got to get back up, you know, and, and, and the emotions are here, but not here. So uh, it's about controlling the emotions for me. Um, I, I learned a lot about controlling emotions, surrendering the outcome, staying in the present. Amazing. How did you start it, uh, to work with Jonging Bank, with Master Bank? Yeah. Um, in 2016, he, uh, he retired after the Rio Olympic Games. So after Rio, he retired from Mexico national team um, right after the Olympics. And then he came straight to Houston. I didn't know any of this was going to happen. In the summer of 2016, um, Well, after the Olympic qualifiers in 2016 for Rio, um, I, my prayer was this. I prayed to God and I said this. I said, God, if this is your will for me, if Tokyo 2020, 2020 at that time <laughs> is your will for me, if, if you want me to continue in this journey, you're going to have to send me a trainer because right now I'm training with no one right now. I'm traveling right now, you know, I'm training in my garage. So if this is something that you're going to have for me and I'm going to pursue, I need you to provide me a trainer. So this was back in what, March, 2016. That was something that I prayed every single day, every single week. Um, and I thought I was going to have to go live somewhere else to fulfill that prayer. <laughs> I was like, okay, I think I need to go, you know, maybe move to this state or this country or whatever so I can train full-time Taekwondo. Um, but then, you know, I kept praying about it and I thought that was going to be the case. But in the summer of 2016, I get an email from um, Song Master um, Mike Song and he invites me to come train with with them in their new school that they're going to be opening in the fall of 2016 with Master Young Bong of Mexico. And when he told me that, I was like, 
like, really? <laughs> I, I've never, I didn't hear any, like, I live in Houston. No one's been talking about this. Why don't I know? And isn't Master Bong in Mexico? Isn't he, like, going to coach at the Olympics right now? Like, I really didn't believe it. So I was like, okay, can you just keep me posted and, and then I'll see how things go. Um, but I never, like, really thought that was actually going to go through. And then after the Olympics uh, in, in August, it was about September now, he messages me again saying, hey, Victoria, we're going to have training this week. Come on by. I was like, okay, just give me the location. I'll come. I come, and sure enough, I see Master Bong there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is weird. Like, Yongging Bong is here in Houston. Is this actually happening? And so they, they kind of explained to me that Master Bong uh, wants to go ahead and retire from the Mexico national team to come over here to Houston to open up his school um, so he can be with his family all the time and he won't have to be away from them so much. And um, so he can open up his school. And I was like, wow, this is like for real. So, yeah, it was in 2016, the fall of 2016, where I started training with Master Bong. And um, I've been training with him ever since. And it's been it's been pretty amazing. And uh, that's why I tell Master Bong that you are the answer to my prayers. Great. And how what what have you learned from Master Bank? I'm sorry. What have you learned from Master Bank? Uh a lot of technical issues that I had, a lot of uh, bad habits that I had. Uh, he helped me a lot with that. Um, and most of all, honestly, he, um, sorry. And most of all, he, he gave me a lot of confidence. Like he told me, I remember the first week I trained with him uh, in the fall of 2016. He asked, he's like, why, why wasn't she at the Olympics? And, you know, he was serious. He's like, what happened? Why didn't she go to the Olympics? Because I guess, you know, he didn't know too much of me and, and whatever, but um, he has his own, you know, uh, things to worry about. But uh, he was very serious. He was like, you're going to be at Tokyo. You're, Tokyo 2020 is your time. You're going to be at Tokyo. He literally told me every single week since then that Tokyo 2020, Tokyo 2020, Tokyo 2020. He literally integrated into my brain so much that it was like, okay, this is going to happen. So it was not only his, his, the training skills of that I learned from him and the skills of fighting that I've learned from him, such as just the basic things, head back, you know, cut first, things like that. Um, it was not only that stuff, my back kicks, my spin, kick, everything. Um, it just went to the next level. But also he put a new confidence in me. He put the confidence of me that if this has come from Master Bong, you know, this is pretty, this is pretty cool. This is a big deal. So he, he put that confidence in me that I needed again, um, especially coming off of a hard loss. So um, it was a lot of that. Right. Amazing. And recently you have opened your own Taekwondo club, Ando Yang. Can you, and parkour also, that's an yeah. interesting mix. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Yeah, um, so I'm here at my school right now. I, maybe you can see a little bit of the background. Um, but in March 2000, to this past year of March, after I qualified for the Olympics, you know, COVID happened and everyone's talking about the Olympics being postponed or canceled or this or that. And so... Before the Olympic qualifiers, my my now fiance, but then the boyfriend um, and his best friend was talking about opening a parkour school, and they were so excited. They're like, "This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna open in the blah 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 blah." I was like, "That's awesome. You know, that's great. You know, it'd be really cool if we collaborate and do taekwondo and parkour." But I told them, I said, "But I couldn't do it right now just because of the Olympics." Um, but now there's possibility of the Olympics being postponed and blah, blah, blah. So I told them this, I said, okay, let's wait. Give me a little bit. Let's see if the, the Olympics gets, gets postponed for next year. If it does get postponed, 
then let's open this gym this this summer. So we were just waiting around, looking at places to open and just waiting on the word to see what was going to happen to the Olympics. Finally, we heard that the Olympics were going to be postponed for next year. And that was the moment I said, OK, let's open this school up 2020 summer, summer 2020. We're going to open up our parkour and taekwondo school. So, um, you know, it was really because of the guys, uh, my, my fiance and his best friend. That was that was they wanted to do it. They were so, so ready. And for me, I was like, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I don't think I'm ready yet. You know, I want to just probably not yet. And then, um, no, it was like, what better time? You know, let's go ahead, open it up now. Now's the time, even though it's COVID. I, uh, I, I don't, everyone's saying, yeah, it might be a bad time to open, but I always, I always see the impossible. I, I always see the possible and the impossible situations because I've been through so many impossible situations in my life. Um, and if I was able to get through it and successfully through Jesus Christ, I can get through this successfully with Jesus Christ. So um, this is why I'm here. I'm, I'm doing this and with, I'm here with my fiance and, his, uh, and our partner, his best friend. And um, uh, we've been open for about two months, it was October, like two and a half, one and a half months now. So almost two months now we've been open and uh, it's doing quite well. Thankfully, thank God, you know, people are starting to come and, and, um, and uh, be more interested in getting out there and not too scared of the virus anymore. So it's, a, it's encouraging to see people come out and, and uh, start doing new things like Taekwondo and parkour. Great. And can children do both things? Uh, one, one day Taekwondo and another day parkour? Yeah, so that's the cool thing. That's, the, that's what we wanted here. We wanted this to be a place where you come and learn martial arts and you learn parkour and they go together like Jackie Chan, right? You, <laughs> you go see Jackie Chan and what, what is he doing? He's doing parkour and he's doing martial arts. So I, we wanted this to be a place where you can be a complete ninja. You can be a complete Jackie Chan. So um, we have, you can come do Taekwondo Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays and come do parkour Tuesday, Thursdays and Fridays and vice versa. Um, so we, so we made the schedule perfect to where if someone wanted to do parkour and Taekwondo, this is the place to do it. You can do it every single day and, uh, just become a full ninja. It'd be Amazing. pretty cool. Yeah. I think I, I find it great. It, uh, apart from the, well, from the mixing, I think it's great because of, you know, this thing of early specialization. So yeah. if you think that uh, give to children a more wide uh, scope, they can be athletes that last longer. Yeah, that's so true. Um, early on, like you said, early on, learning early on these skills, it, and it helps them, I think for kids especially, and older adults. Older adults and kids, uh, the parkour is so great because parkour is all, all your body, you know, it's body resistance. So you're like pulling yourself up, you know, you're pushing yourself up. Um, you're using your body weight as your weight, as your resistance. So um, for kids and for adults, older adults, that's really, really uh, great for exercise. Um, and it goes, it goes perfect with Taekwondo because um, you're using your body weight. You know, you're, you're getting strong using body resistant training. And in Taekwondo, that's very important. Amazing. Congratulations for, for this new club. Thank you. It's Belip Komitachi, right? Yes, Belip Also, Also, the, the name is great. Thank you. Uh, normally, when you are, uh, well, uh, for example, before this COVID thing, when you are preparing for a competition, mm -hmm. how, how, how is a day in your life? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a, another question together because if not, I will forget, but it's very important for me. How do you fund your training? Okay. Um, so uh, before COVID, a normal training, 
depends on what I'm getting ready for. So getting ready for the Olympic qualifiers, um, again, I was training three times a week Taekwondo, two times a week physical training. Um, I was uh, taking care of my health first, and then mental, and then physical came with it. But uh, leading up, you know, I was training just once a, once a day Taekwondo uh, and two times a week physical, uh, depending on how my body felt. You know, I really just listened to my body. If I didn't feel good one day, then I wasn't going to train. You know, I wasn't going to push myself to where I hurt myself. You know, uh, there's a fine line of pushing your body and overtraining your body. Uh, and at the age that I was and am now, I was 26 years old, I'm 27 now, but I had to learn to be more mature and not uh, train like a little kid where I can train three times a day, you know? That's not the case. Uh, it's about training smarter and about training more efficient uh, than training more physical. So that's what, I, that's what I changed in my training and I'm gonna keep the same. Uh, so leading up to the Olympics, I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna change anything. I spoke to a lot of mental coaches, um, really, really, you know, high up there mental coaches and what they told me is, why are you going to change? It worked. Don't change. You know, now it's the Olympics. Now you have to train two times a day, three times a day. No, keep doing what you did. Uh, your health is number one, maturity, um, intelligence, training intelligently and efficiently is more important than making yourself feel like you accomplished something because you train two times a day or three times a day. So, um, so it's just following that, and uh, that's pretty much what I'll be doing. Now, before that, before my surgery in 2019, I was training probably two times a day, you know, um, uh, at least one to two times a day every single day. So I was definitely training much more, much, much more than I was before. Um, and that could be a reason why I had the, the surgery that I did, you know, so... Um, it's uh, like God just telling me to pull it back and relax. And that's what I'm doing. Great. And the other question, how, how do you fund your, your training? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so my training is funded by my dad. My dad has been funding all of my training since I was a little girl. <laughs> He's been funding most of my travels. Um, however, the Olympic Committee, um, they're now, you know, funding all my travels and, and training camps and things of that sort. Um, but anything that the Olympic committee doesn't cover, uh, my dad covers it for me, thankfully. So, um, that's pretty much how I'm able to do the things I, that I can. Excellent. Mm, do you have any hobbies uh, aside from Taekwondo? I, I think you, you used to paint. Yeah, I did a little bit. I need to get back into it. I, I want to uh, more. It's just now I feel like I just, I don't know, maybe need another lockdown <laughs> to happen to where I can't do anything <laughs> but, uh, but maybe paint. But uh, uh, another hobby, I love to travel. I love exploring other cultures and countries and and just learning history of the of the countries and co different cultures. So I'd say traveling is a huge hobby of mine. And uh, also uh, shopping. I love shopping. So I would say traveling, shopping, uh, reading. I love reading. Uh, I love to read on things that obviously interest me. Uh, history, biblical, uh, you know, uh, the Bible, things like that of that nature. So always learning, um, always wanting to just level up on my thinking and the way I am. Of all the places that you have visited, what's the most amazing place for you? Uh, uh, for me, uh, I think Italy, for me, and the beauty of the country and the food and the people, it just everything is so perfect uh, like the scenery the 
the beautiful landscaping and the the beaches and the mountains and the food and I think Italy is the most beautiful country. Another country I would say is Korea. I love Korean culture. I love Korean food. Korea is so beautiful. It has a beautiful nature side to it. Um, so I would say Italy and Korea. Great, amazing. And going to the other hobby you have, uh, and it's a question that I do often, uh, is there a, a, a book that you have given most as a gift? If not, one to three books that that most impacted your life. Oh, yes, you did say that. Oh, I needed to write that down. Um, oh, gosh, okay. What's it called? I think it's uh, Chop Wood and Carry Water. I have to get you the name of it. Um, that was, honestly, that was, the book that changed a lot of my thinking um, for the Olympic qualifiers. I read that right before the Olympic qualifiers. So I think it was chop wood and carry water or something like that. Um, my strength trainer gave me that one. So that was great. And then also, um, uh, which is it? Um, I'm really bad with names, by the way. Like, really bad. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, what's it called? It's by Mark... Ba I know the author, Mark Batterson. Uh, oh! Uh, 36. Draw the Circle. Draw the Circle. Uh, I think that's a prayer... That's a devotional. It's a 30-day devotional. Draw the Circle. And then the circle draw, circle, and then the circle maker. Oh, the circle maker. I, I'll I'll write you the books because I'm really yeah, bad thank you, at thank the you. names. Yeah, so I just open it and read it, and then I don't think about <laughs> the title. Yeah, like oh wait, what am I reading again? Oh okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it's like draw the circle and then uh, the circle maker. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, what purchase of less than one hundred dollars uh, has most positively impacted your life in the last six months? Hundred dollars. What? What purchase of a hundred dollars? Yeah. Um. What have I purchased for hundred dollars? That's a hard question. I, I can't say. I don't know. Okay. It, I uh, don't know. I, we would be here for a while and I don't want to take all your time. Okay. <laughs> don't worry. I could come up with it later. Excellent. For the Spanish interview. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, what you consider are not good for? What's that? What you are not good for? For what oh. you, are, you, are, you, you, you are not good? I'm not good for singing. Oh, good <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well, that's a good one. Not good for singing. If you could have a gigantic billboard that anybody, that anybody in the world could see, which message would you put on it? Jeez. Uh, uh, it would definitely be probably a verse. Uh, maybe it would be Proverbs 16.3. Uh, commit to the Lord, whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Or maybe it will be um, uh, Psalms 25, which is uh, it's a prayer of protection and trust in God. Um, definitely some uh, a Bible verse that uh, people can maybe find truth and uh, search search a little bit in that. Great. Amazing. Just three more questions, Victoria. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, what new behavior, habit, or skill has most improved your life? What, what skill? In the last five years, have you acquired a new habit or uh, skill that has most impacted your life? Um, yes. Um, a skill of, or a habit of 
waking up every single day and giving thanks to God for lit everything, anything. There's so many things to be thankful for. And when you can find all the things that there are to be grateful for, it's hard to look at all the things to be ungrateful for. So if you can find gratitude in the small things of your life, life, uh, another day of life, uh, a life of, of being alive, a life of walking on two feet, a life of being able to grab things with two hands, uh, a life of being able to eat uh, by yourself, you know, um, things like that. If when you look at that, it's very hard to have a day that you're ungrateful for and um, that you, you know, just consider a bad day, you know? So just living a life of gratitude, I say. Great. What advice would you give to a 13 year old starting to compete in Taekwondo? Um, 13 year old. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. It's uh, if you really want this, don't give up. And if don't expect any results overnight, it's, uh, it's, it's small habits every single day built up. That's how you get to your goals. It's not, um, in one day, you know, like I said, it's every single moment of your day throughout a long period of time built up into to to achieving your goals so um perseverance is everything you know how much do you really want it if this is what you really really want it's going to show um when the times get hard and tough so if you ever go through an injury acl surgery and meniscus don't don't think it's the end of the world you know it's it really is not Uh, ACL surgery is not the end of your career. It is if you think it is. It, you, it is if you act like a victim. If, if you don't see yourself like a victim, you won't be a victim. So, right. um, so just make sure to, to go through life as a marathon and to expect the bumps in the road. And that's what makes your success and your journey so sweet and beautiful. And, um, you can use it to help others and inspire others. So uh, I would say, again, to anyone who goes through a surgery, especially ACL, don't look at it as the end of your career. I see a lot of people come to me saying, I just, you know, had ACL surgery. I don't know how I'm going to come back or, and I can't come back or it was career ending. ACL surgery is not career ending unless you make it career ending. It really is the way you look at your circumstance and your, it, whether you're a victim to that injury or not. Um, don't look at yourself as a victim. Great. Uh, last question. What are bad recommendations that you hear in the Taekwondo competition environment? Some idea you don't agree with. I really, 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 really hope that when we do go back to competition, that there's nothing on the helmet that's covering. I really hope there's no mask. I really hope uh, there's no glass protection, or not glass, uh, plastic protection, anything like that. My hope is that we go back the same, but the same as uh, fighters, you know, the same thing that we were wearing before. Maybe the referees, yeah, wear masks, you know, maybe the coaches or whatever wear masks. But as far as the, the fighters go, take our temperatures before. Don't make us wear any masks. Don't make us do, you know, any of that covering the, the face. I mean, it, that, it, that takes away from the experience. And that, that would really be annoying. Uh, so I just really hope and pray that as fighters, when we fight, we go back just the same. Amazing. Thank you very much, yeah. Victoria. It's been a pleasure. I don't know if you want to add something or you want to say something that I miss quest to question to you. Uh, no, just thank you so much for having me. You were great. Um, the books, uh, I'm so, so sorry. I forgot to look at look them up. 
I'll message you the book names and maybe the links or whatnot. Um, but uh, no, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. See you. Bye bye.